Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this conjuncture, uh, a seminar series exploring the key issues that define our current moment. This series is brought to you by New Formations, a journal of culture, theory and politics. I'm Rebecca Brammel. I'm a member of the editorial board of New Formations, and I'm the chair for this evening. And we're going to be discussing digital patriarchy, a title which points towards a very complex and contested dimension of our conjuncture, namely the growing power and influence of digital platforms and the ways in which this power intersects with social structures which oppress and exploit women. This evening, um, we're going to be exploring these issues both within the culture of programmers and technologists, the culture of Silicon Valley, and the culture of users and consumers, um, so online cultures. We're absolutely delighted to be joined by Sarah Bane Weiser, Ben Little, and Alison Winch. And we're also looking forward to your con contributions later in the seminar. So let me introduce our three speakers um, at greater length. Sarah Bane Weiser is Distinguished Professor of Communication at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania and Professor at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of S Southern California. As Sarah says, her job is complicated at the moment. Um, her books include uh, Authentic TM, The Politics of Ambivalence in a Brand Culture and more recently Empowered Popular Feminism and Popular mis Misogyny. And we've just been speaking about how Sarah has a new book in the pipeline on economies of believability. Ben Little is lecturer in media and cultural politics at the University of East Anglia, and he's the co-author with Jane Arthurs of Russell Brand Comedy, Celebrity and Politics, published in 2016. And Alison Winch is lecturer in media studies at the University of East Anglia. She's the author of Girlfriends and Post-Feminist Sisterhood from 2013, and she's also a poet, and her debut collection was published in 2019. Alison and Ben are the authors of a fantastic article, Patriarchy in the Digital Conjuncture, an analysis of Google's James Damore, which we published in New Formations in 2019. And just this summer, Ben and Alison's book, The New Patriarchs of Digital Capitalism, was published with Rouseledge. So we have this fantastic panel um, to talk to us tonight about digital patriarchy. Sarah is going to speak for about 25 minutes to start off, uh, follow, followed by Ben and Alison's talk. Um, and after that, we're going to open up to you for questions and discussion. And you can either add those questions to the chats while they're talking if you want to, or you can wait until the end and you can ask a question using your mic and your video. So um, without further ado, let's um, start with Sarah's talk. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, and thanks to New Formations for organizing this, um, not just the series, um, the seminar series, but also um, the different writings on the conjuncture in the last couple of years. They've been incredibly useful um, for me and thinking through kind of what's happening at the at the current moment. So I thought I would start a little bit um, before getting to online digital cultures, as, as Rebecca mentioned, I thought I would start more broadly with thinking about the conjuncture um, and how, how does it, what does it mean to think about patriarchies and new patriarchies conjuncturally? Um, what are some of the elements um, of the contemporary conjuncture that um, actually kind of inform and enable particular digital cultures to emerge? Um, and so I'm going to be talking a little bit about digital cultures, but also more broadly about media um, and uh, sexual violence. Um, I think that it's important to position new patriarchies or networked misogyny as part of a broader historical conjuncture um, that is one that is conditioned by the spectacular visibility of networked media and of social movements um, around the world that are feminist based like um, Me Too, of course, but also um, Neo no Menos, um, other Latin American um, global movements, movements in the global south um, that are contesting and challenging patriarchal functions and practices. So in this current work that Rebecca mentioned, um, I'm looking at or I'm thinking about the conjuncture in which the believability of women and people who identify as women 
have become um, an object of cultural preoccupation, anxiety, and contention. Um, as, as the series has been kind of centered around, um, Stuart Hall and his colleagues uh, described conjunctures as contingent moments of social crisis that, that emerge through um, and, and also can therefore reveal articulations of economic, cultural, political, and ideological forces in particular historical periods. And you know, when he, I, I've been rereading Policing the Crisis lately and have been thinking about some of the incredible similarities between that moment and the moment we're living in right now. I'm sorry if you can hear that ding. I don't know how to turn off my notifications because you know I'm a media professor. So um, apologies for that. Um, uh, uh, thinking conjuncturally uh, means taking up points of contradiction um, and tension as, as sort of portals through which to investigate how various forms of power are, are delimiting conditions of possibility for social change, even as they may also be opening those conditions. So I'm thinking that when I'm, when I'm looking at, at formations of new patriarchies in the contemporary moment, that we need to think of the co-emergence of media, political and cultural practices within what really is a very short period of time as something that is, is analytically significant and, and possibly politically revealing. So I'm, I'm kind of, what, what I'd love to hear in Q&A and talk about with Allison and Ben is what does it mean to think conjuncturally about gender and patriarchy at this moment? And when thinking about this, I couldn't help but uh, think, um, but, but be reminded of the latest piece by Judith Butler in The Guardian last week, which has predictably um, seen both praise and criticism um, as their work often does. I, I want to, you know, Butler's headline or the headline of The Guardian is a key way for me to think about what, about thinking conjuncturally about patriarchy. Why is the idea of gender? provoking backlash the world over. Um, what is it about gender and anti-gender movements as Butler talks about in that piece that we can connect to other sorts of populist movements like nationalism um, um, and, uh, and, and, and white nationalism and misogyny, but also um, uh, connect to the logics of fascism. So I think it's important to kind of center these different populist movements and, and think about the logics that they share. Um, you know, the fact is that fascism and other extreme right movements have always also run on an overtly misogynistic agenda. Um, it's not an epiphenomenon, in other, in other words. Um, in 2016, when writing about kind of uh, the emergence of Trump and other sorts of authoritarian movements, the reporter Matthew Lyons said that harassing and defaming women isn't just a tactic. It also serves the alt-right's broader agenda and long-term vision for society. So I'm, you know, thinking about those kind of movements and the ways in which they overlap and are entwined with each other as part of this um, contemporary historical conjuncture. Another element of the conjuncture that has a lot to do with this, I think, and many people have written about this, is neoliberal capitalism. And I won't rehearse that here. Um, but I do think that one of the things that is important to think about in terms of neoliberal capitalism in this conjuncture is the ways in which neoliberalism ha has encouraged and enabled a shift um, in how we understand victimhood. Um, and, and more specifically in this work on believability, we're focusing on the political logics of neoliberalism that authorize privileged white men, precisely those who benefit the most from neoliberal capitalism to claim that they are victims um, of those who benefit the least. Um, uh, women, non-binary people, uh, black communities, people of color, migrants, uh, immigrants, and so forth. So as again, lots of people have talked about this, including Wendy Brown and Catherine Rottenberg and Daniel Hosang and others, the political um, economic discourse of neoliberalism has appropriated the disc the rhetoric not not the discourse necessarily but the rhetoric of the civil rights and feminist movements of the mid-20th century other social movements as well as a way to um, kind of instantiate and usher in shifted definitions of 
freedom. And this, these neoliberal definitions of freedom are decidedly against the downward uh, redistribution justice of anti-capitalism, but um, rather are a form of distributive justice that is ruled by the market and and um, you know I, and has the market identify who gets these freedoms and who doesn't. So um, this uh, you know is also key to allowing particular privileged individuals to claim victimhood at the moment. Um, and it's also about nostalgia, right? And a lot of these. Um, the new patriarchies um, are about a kind of recuperative model of nostalgia where, um, you know, uh, a patriarchy is no longer what it used to be and it's an effort to claim it back. So, so those are parts of the conjuncture. Um, another crucial part um, is uh, about the media scape and that's kind of what I want to, um, you know, uh, focus on for the rest of this. Um, the the media scape, the digital online cultures that Rebecca mentioned in the in the beginning, the proliferation of what is called mis and disinformation online, and the crisis, what is also being called the crisis of the post truth, and how this is a crisis that takes shape and get, gets life online. Um, I'm thinking of this actually more and more in the context of Allison and Ben's fantastic new books, a new book on uh, new patriarchies of tech power, um, as well as the timely context of, you know, um, not the first whistleblower, but the whistleblower Francis, uh, Francis Haugen's testimony before the U.S. Congress last week about, and I think she, she testi gave testimony to the British Parliament today, um, about how Facebook puts profit over harm, something that most of us kind of know either because we've researched it, it or we've been um, uh, a target of it, but also how uh, online platforms obfuscate and design hate speech and misinformation um, um, that often takes the you know, shape of racism and misogyny. So I, you know, this media scape, I think, is really crucial for us to understand the current conjuncture. At the center of circulation of these of current forms of online um, misogyny and online misinformation are these digital media and communication platforms, which centrally use disinformation to mobilize citizens, communities, and ideologies. Um, and again, a key strategy of these online communities has been about recuperation. Uh, you know, um, there's there's lots and lots of um, uh, messages in digital culture that are filled with um, fa false campaigns about how women and feminists have not only destroyed society, but even more crucially, emasculated it. So within this crisis of, you know, of masculinity that we see being amplified by digital culture, um, some men see themselves as losing cultural and political ground and relinquishing patriarchal authority, which also is, is a really interesting contradiction to Allison and Ben's work on the new patriarchs of tech. Women and specifically feminism are assumed to be the reason for this loss, the reason for um, uh, melancholy about the past and are often targets um, for these campaigns, um, rather than say targeting precarity, global economic collapse, capitalism itself, living through a pandemic, um, austerity, or you know, many, many other reasons why there may be a loss here, women and feminists are usually seen as the target. Um, and, and, and again, you know, um, a normalized misogyny is often the price that women pay just for simply being visible online um, with digital platforms like uh, Twitter and Facebook doing very little to monitor misogyny online. And there's so many examples of this, and we can talk about this if it's interesting to people in Q&A from image-based online violence to deep fakes to the kind of industry, the online industry that has been fueled by men's rights organizations that um, alleges that women routinely and often make false accusations of rape and sexual assault. So, you know, this is part of that digital, um, uh, can, you know, part of the conjuncture is this digital media scape um, that, that encourages a different kind of patriarchy to emerge. So 
I want in the last few minutes of this talk, I, I want to talk about some responses to the conjuncture um, um, in, you know, in, in thinking about what it means to have new uh, kind of patriarchal context within the media scape. And again, like Rebecca said, I've been um, I'm working on a book with Catherine Higgins on gender, uh, race and believability. And one of the things that we are looking at in this book is the proliferation of media productions in the past five to six years um, in precisely this, the conjuncture that I just discussed, including the broad and complex context of global feminist movements like Me Too. And these are media productions that actually tackle and center believability in some interesting and complex ways. So you have television shows like I May Destroy You and Unbelievable and The Morning Show um, and Impeachment. Um, you have films like Promising Young Woman, The Assistant, um, Bombshell. You have lots of books um, that are kind of, some are memoirs like Anita Hill's recent Believing, um, you also have Deborah Turkheimer's book, Credible, about the ways in which the legal system constructs gender and, um, you know, in the context of sexual violence. You have lots and lots of press, um, um, including the, you know, very, very visible Jody Cantor and Megan uh, Tuohy's um, ex, uh, investigative reporting on Harvey Weinstein in the New York Times, Ronan Farrow's investigative reporting in the New Yorker on Weinstein and others. You have their books about those reportings to, you know, Farrow's Catch and Kill and Cantor and Tuohy's She Said. Um, and, and I can't help, again, but think of what Hall said when he was writing when they were writing Policing the Crisis and talking about the different elements of the conjuncture and, and focused, you know, had, had an incredibly helpful focus on the media and the press as institutions that work sort of peripheral or ancillary to the state, but also did the work of securing a kind of popular influence about in that, in that context about criminality and black youth and Britain. And so I want to think about what th this media scape in the current moment has to do, you know, kind of shares a similar space with that. And there's something, you know, there's something about the productions that I think is, is really interesting to think through. And I'd love to hear from people about what they think. There's, you know, there's arguably there's a way that you could talk about the proliferation of media productions produced and sold on capitalist uh, media and publishing platforms that are that feel very much like what the media scholar Herman Gray has called an incitement to visibility, where visibility is really what the goal is, um, rather than structural change. Um, where we're not really sure what the excess of that visibility is, and if indeed there is even an excess. So, you know, to think about these productions at the same time, we're kind of put, you know, trying to think what, what can they do for us? What can these media productions do, do for us? And they're positioned, um, we argue, within uh, what we call an economy of believability. And we use this as a way to think through gender and race politics that frame sexual violence. The economy of believability represents an affective continuum within which subjects are unevenly positioned to access and harness uh, believability and struggles over truth in public culture. So, you know, as with all economies, the positionalities of, of subjects within believability emerge as a product of labor and resources, which tend to exist in um, uh, you know, an inverse relationship to one another. The more resources a subject already possesses, the less labor is required to secure access to believability. So you know, the more resources you have, including but not limited to you know, cultural, social, and economic capital, um, as well as structural privileges that stem from gender and race and class, the less labor you have to do in order to be believed and vice versa, right? And so we're thinking about how believability and gender and race work conditionally. So, you know, in some ways we can talk about how in general, um, women are typically not believed when they make accusations of sexual um, assault in public except if you are a white woman and you are accusing 
a black man of sexual violence, right? Then there's a sort of, you know, readily believable kind of context. Um, and so we're thinking through what these, these access to believability, what they mean. Some truths and some truth tellers emerge in the spotlight for a variety of different reasons, including historical, they've always been in the spotlight, or structural, they play well for corporate media, um, and epistemic reasons, they resonate with already established um, analytic frameworks of subjectivity and universality. On all of those fronts, historical, structural, and epistemic, um, wealthy white men find themselves at a considerable advantage. So men, but especially white men in positions of power, have is historically occupied a central position within this economy of, of believability as ideal believable subjects. Um, and they're seen as objective, while women are always already subjective. And you can see this play out in a digital landscape. Within the context for sexual violence, the mandate for objectivity that's at the heart of Western understandings of truth um, operate as a mechanism of domination, of, as, as several scholars have pointed out. It simultaneously locks in the knowledge of particularized subjects from the realm of truth. I'm sorry, locks out while locking in the truths that are particular to Anglo-European contexts and white men's experiences of them. So I see that, we see that in these media productions and in this conjuncture, we see these ideas about truth and believability reinforced and, and, and kind of um, solidified in many different ways. But I want to end with just thinking about what is it that we can do? Is there something else we can do? Hall's Policing the Crisis, the last part of that book was about resistance and about um, cultural production and the ways in which resistance can take place within the field of media and cultural produ uh, production. There's something about the way in which so many of these media productions that we're talking about emphasize a sense of futility. And I'm very grateful to Joe Littler for pointing me in this direction. You know, most of the Me Too media or Me Too landscape that we're analyzing reflect not just the various work forms of work that women must engage in in order to attach believability uh, to allegations of sexual assault, but more bleakly, in some ways, the likely failure of that endeavor, the futility of speaking out, the futility of struggling to be believed only to be told that you're a liar. And taken together, if you look at this kind of this proliferation of media, many of these productions reveal the enduring futility of speaking out about sexual assault in a broader conjunctural moment that is framed by things like Me Too and the angry and vicious uh, cultural backlashes against it. But what if we were to use futility as a way to think more generatively about this conjuncture and about this, these media productions in particular. What if we were to think of futility instead of you know, the, the, the con kind of conventional way that most capitalist media provides us with a redemptive narrative, um, one that can be imagined as what Lauren Berlant coined uh, cruel optimism or what Roz Gill has talked about as the kind of cheery forms of popular feminism where we just have to be resilient and get over things, right? In this kind of neoliberal sense. What if instead of that, we thought about centering futility as a potentially generative way to think about the relationship between um, media visibility and its um, excess? And maybe it's through playing with futility that we can move through this impasse that has so solidly constructed cultural and political imaginaries of how we understand sexual violence. And maybe if we kind of um, thought about the ways in which current media on sexual violence can help normalize futility of such structures like the law and, and policing and criminality and hegemonic institutions, maybe then this media scape can also help us imagine a different sort of discourse about sexual violence and new patriarchies. Thanks. Absolutely fantastic, Sarah. I really enjoyed listening to that. Um, and thank you for the conjunctural perspective. Really brilliant, as Jem says. Let's go over to Alison and Ben now. 
Hiya. Um, can I share screen? You can, but Gem needs to make you into a host as well. Okay. So just bear with us a moment. God, I'm thinking about futility. I mean, this is, I'm going to talk about you a project. Can do it which... now. You, should, you can do it now, Ben. I can do it now. Yeah. Uh, that's the one. There we go. Okay, so you can all see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, that was that was a, a wonderful, a wonderful point to sort of um, take over from because I, I think I think one thing in doing this project, which I'm I'm going to introduce, um, I'm going to introduce the project as a whole, and then Alison's going to talk a little bit specifically um, around theorizing patriarchy and misogyny. But one of the things which you know this this project is looking specifically at the the richest men in the world. So this is looking at the wealthiest white men of, of all the wealthy white men uh, and, and how they secure their dominance, how they legitimate uh, their power and how their sort of celebrity and, and understanding them primarily as a form of, um, yeah, a form, a form of celebrity within digital capitalism, like, you know, how, how they secure it. And, and I, I must admit, like, you know, we, we saw this as a as a conjunctural project and I got to the end of, and I don't have a straightforward I mean like the answer I think we gave in our conclusion is that you have to sort of disassemble liberalism as a whole to like really get at these guys so um maybe that feeling of futility can become productive so thanks Sarah um yeah so uh this is this is a project we worked on worked on for about four years um the, there's been a number of different uh, outputs I hate that phrase um we wrote a book we wrote three articles. Um, one of them was on James Damore, who we'll talk about in a little bit in, in this talk. We wrote two on Mark Zuckerberg and then the book, which was about sort of the network of men that dominate the top of Silicon Valley. Um, so I'm gonna start by looking at a couple of sort of illustrative images. So the first one, is it gonna let me click through? Yeah. So the first one, this is a, this is a really famous image. It's the PayPal Mafia. Um, they are a, group of exclusively men who worked on um, the payment site, PayPal, sold it to eBay in 2001, I think, and then used that money, the money from that, that sale to sort of seed um, not only their own vast fortunes by investing across Silicon Valley, but also their ideology and their values uh, across and through those companies. So in that image, you've got the founders of um, LinkedIn, Palantir, Yelp, YouTube would be there, that they would be in the gap at the back, but um, they got bought by uh, Google and they thought it politic to remove them from the image because they didn't want to be associated uh, with this particular form of masculinity because Google's obviously all about not being evil, or it certainly was in 2007 when this, was, this photo was taken. And the other person who's not there is Elon Musk. And again, we'll come to him in a sec. So there's a, there's a network of uh, men who gained their wealth together, shared similar values, um, and use that to shape the hegemonic um, industry in, in, you know, globally in the in in the current under in the current conjunction. So that's 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 the first image I want to share to you share with you. And you can sort of see them. They're, they're there as a mafia. You can also understand them maybe as sort of like a posse on the Wild West. And Peter Thiel, this figure at, right at the front, um, is kind of their their sheriff who who protects the the Wild West for for people like him to, to have their space and to make their fortunes. And here he is again in the next image, sitting next to Donald Trump. So he marshals um, literally, uh, going, oh, I'll stop with the metaphor, but like he, he marshals this group of other mostly men um, to come and um, meet with Donald Trump. This is the first sort of big public meeting Trump called after, after being elected. So this is the president elect and he's sort of sitting there amongst uh, executives from from executive and founders from one of the biggest tech firms and saying like, you know, we're here to get on, we're here to let, you know, to let you do well. And what this sort of image shows, and I'll talk about who the people are in just a sec, what this image shows is sort of the political pragmatism of the tech industry, of its ability to sort of shift its politics to meet, um, you know, the contingencies of power, basically. Uh, everyone in that room had at some point, or everyone who wasn't a Republican, obviously Mike Pence, is a bit different, but you know they, they were all they had all sort of been quite vocal in their opposition to Trump's um, Trump's election. And as soon as he gets in, they they come, they meet, they they pose for this for this um, publicity image, effectively, um, to sort of say no, 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 we'll we'll play ball um, here. Missing from the picture is Mark Zuckerberg, 
he had it's difficult to say I mean it's difficult to sort of say he had sort of presidential ambitions at this point but he certainly felt that he was going to do something politically to challenge Trump at this very moment and so instead he sends Sheryl Sandberg uh, so she's sitting there as well she's another one of our, our case studies and um, just off the side um, next to Safra Katz who's the CEO of Oracle um, one of the very few uh, women of significant power in Silicon Valley uh, is Elon Musk. So Elon Musk is there as well, and he he joined um, Trump's Trump summit. Now, obviously, these are people which are very familiar to us. But just in case anyone else doesn't know who they are, we've got Jeff Bezos in the far uh, in the far corner. Next to him is Larry Page from Google, Mike Pence, Peter Thiel, and Elon Musk. So this, these are these are the people we spent four years trying to understand. Um. I think the other thing to mention here, which kind of came too late to go into the book, um, we saw, I think we tried to edit something in about it, is just how much the pandemic has accentuated uh, their wealth and their power, even as their press, their sort of their popular standing has has collapsed. So um, you know, Bezos is sort of flirts around two hundred billion dollars in terms of his personal wealth, and this is despite losing a third of it. In a divorce halfway halfway through well towards the end of when we were writing writing the book elon musk is unbelievable the amount of uh money he's managed to accumulate and and he's gone from something like 10 or 12 billion to, to 230 billion i think it was today like over, over the course of the pandemic and a large part of that has been through the deployment of his celebrity of his ability to marshal large numbers of, of, I have to assume, mostly men for a particular brand of masculinity, um, which says, you know, invest in me, I'll make you rich and I'll save the world, basically. Um, so, so yeah, so I, thought, I, I think that's important that, they, that we can sort of see them getting like whistleblowers or whatever politicians having a go at them, but actually their core wealth has only increased. Okay. So, um, I'm going to talk briefly about our methodology. I'm going to give you some sort of some of the empirical stuff that's come out of the work that we've done. Um, we initially started looking at popular culture. So we were looking at um, forms of like representations of geek masculinity and trying to associate that, think, think that through alongside these sort of these patriarchal figures who dominate tech companies, this new form of uh, patriarchal power, patriarchal leadership, which has become visible um, within Silicon Valley. Um, we, we sort of realized that actually the, the, there was this huge wealth of what we call airport literature. So it's books generally written by people who are already quite enthusiastic about uh, the tech industry. So it's written for them and, and, um, and yeah, represents a sort of coherent ideological like statement of the value and importance of Silicon Valley and the tech industry more generally. Um, we, we took 95 of these books, I literally cut them up um, and fed them into a scanner and turned that into a database so we could do a mix of sort of close and distant reading. Um, using in vivo more for the, the close reading, so looking at stuff in broad context and the and sketch engine for the distant reading stuff. Um, I think this worked quite well. You'll see a little bit about what, what came out. I mean, it's also worth mentioning this wasn't the only place we looked. We also picked a few other areas to look at in detail. So nearly all of them have done commencement speeches. So they've gone back to their universities and told graduating students how wonderful life in Silicon Valley is or shared some sort of nugget of wisdom or their values there. Um, and they are often quite revealing. And they're also quite carefully curated celebrity performances as well. We looked at IPOs, which are these statements of ideology where the key thing with all these companies is that they they tend not to be. I mean, Amazon is. They tend not to be structured like ordinary companies. They tend to have special classes of shareholding. So you know, Facebook and Google, um, even though Zuckerberg doesn't own uh, more than fifty percent of the company, he controls more than fifty percent of the voting rights. Right. So the IPOs are are locations where that is justified. Um, and there are other places where this happens. Newspapers tend to be another place where you have these sort of two classes of shares. And that's because you're trying to maintain an, ideolo an ideological coherence. It's not simply subject to the, uh, you know, the quarterly shareholder, um, the quarterly profit statement. Um, and finally, we looked at a few sort of set piece things. So interviews or um, one I got, I got really sort of taken away, taken, um, taken with is the 
you remember the ice bucket challenge from in 2014? So they'd all stand and pour these buckets of water over their head for Lou Gehrig's disease. And this is actually something that started in Silicon Valley. Um, and so, you know, there's someone in the British Medical Journal has, or well, the Lancet, I think, like did uh, an analysis of all of the, of which chains of bucket pourings went furthest and found that Mark Zuckerberg's had the longest chain and did a direct correlation between the wealth of the person starting a chain and the likelihood it would continue further. So, I mean, that was that was really interesting. So you can see these networks and the relationships between them um, in these locations. And that's something we did a lot of work on. We looked a lot at like, how the networks are formed and how they, how they operate and how they sort of connect to one another and support each other. I'll let Alison talk a little bit about that in a sec. Instead, I'm going to show you some examples of the sorts of texts we were working with. So from a close reading perspective, and I'm giving you sort of two opposite examples here. So the first one is from Chaos Monkeys, which is written by, a, again, a, a sort of a dissident Facebook employee. He was senior in sales, Antonio Garcia Martinez. Uh, he went on to write for Wired after leaving. And um, I think he's kind of been cancelled now, if that's the correct term um, for, for the sort of thing I'm about to read to you. So this is this is like you know uh, a not atypical attitude to women um, from the material. So most women in the Bay Area are soft and weak, closeted and naive, despite their claims of worldliness and generally full of shit. They have their self-regarding entitlement feminism and ceaselessly vaunt their independence. But the reality is, come the epidemic, plague, or foreign invasion, they'd become precisely the sort of useless baggage you'd trade for a, shot, a box of shotgun shells or a jerry can of diesel. So that's the sort of material that you could find in these books. And conversely, we looked at, we also included in the concordance um, a lot of the critiques of Silicon Valley. So we, we, we didn't just restrict it to the, to the purely ideological pro-tech um, pro industry stuff. We also include people from within the tech industry who are critiquing it. So for instance, Alan Powell, and this is her writing about an experience on a private jet with um, a partner from Kleiner Perkins, the Santal Road. Um, investment firm. So in a conversation, so she's sitting there and she's trying to get be part of the conversation. She's trying to participate, um, sit at the table. She's trying to listen to Sheryl Sandberg and lean in. And this is what happens. So in a conversation about sex workers, the CEO asked Ted what kind of girls he liked. Ted said that he preferred white girls, Eastern European to be specific. The CEO named some older fellow tech guys who were dating really young women and went on and on until the tech investor on my right graciously tried to start a private conversation with me. And you can see like the levels in which both in terms of her gender and her ethnicity, that Ellen Power is being forced out, made, to, made, to be, made it very, very clear that she is unwelcome at the table, that this is not a space or a place um, for women. So again, this is illustrative. I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Alison in a sec to think about some of the um, theoretical ways in which we might want to theorize this. But that was the close reading. And then from the distant reading, so this is where we looked at the concordance as a whole. Um, and there's a, there's a few figures here. So uh, what we did is we, we used sort of keywords and um, concordance in general, which we look at, you know, how, how many times a word appears, what it appears with, um, what are the sort of context it might, it might come up in and so on. But this is just, just frequency. This is just word frequency, this table. And there's two comparison um, corpora I've got there. So one is a scrape of, I think it's 15 billion words from the web in 2015. And the other is, every book published in 2008, right? And they, these, are, these are two sort of points of comparison. So the first one I wanna draw your attention to is um, how many times men and women are referred to. And I want to hold you to hold that, those numbers in your mind as we look at uh, he and she, and I'll explain that in a sec. So the first one is, is when we look at the concordance as a whole, we looked at the whole database, you can see that men and women are not actually that, the references to men and women are not actually that significant, right? I mean, they are significant, but they're not that significant. Um, if you look compared to 2008, they're, they're considerably better than like normal book publication in 2008, right? So, so you might think, oh, that's okay. But then if you exclude the books which are specifically about women or sort of feminist critiques of Silicon Valley, uh, it looks very, very similar. So you, you, you get to roughly, there's a three references to every, to men for every one reference there is to women, right? And that's the same roughly as Google, as Google Engram. It's much worse than the internet as a whole. Um, so if you don't look at books, if you just look at text on the internet, it's much worse. Um, but then you have to contextualize that by looking at who's acting. So 
Um, when the pronouns he or she are used, they tend to indicate a continuous active subject in the sentence someone is named, and then the following sentence, they, he or she is used um, to indicate their continuing action. Right, so it's a good way to see who is present and doing things um, in a body of text. So in Google Ngram, it's roughly two and a half times as many men as it is women. Men, men tend to be the active subject two and a half times. In, in these tech books, men are over five times uh, more active. So it's, it's twice as bad as the 2008 um, So, I mean, this is a a bit positivistic, I don't know, for a seminar about the conjuncture, but um, what you can see is, is that this is, this is, a, this is a, a location, this is a culture, this is a, this is a body of text in which um, women are extremely passive in terms of the language that's used around them. So that's, I just wanted to give you those, those two things, and then I'm going to hand over to Alison to talk about patriarchy. Hey, thanks, Ben. So I'm going to talk a bit about patriarchy and then how it might relate to misogyny, at least in relation to some of these men. So the way we use patriarchy is always contextual. It's not a theoretical frame that can be applied without taking into account contemporary political structures, histories, specific colonial projects. Historically, the term patriarchy has been highly contested on multiple fronts. And it's still a concept that is not easily assimilated in many feminist critical work. So we try to hold on to the clarity of the idea while also being attentive to arguments, criticizing the often uh, universalizing essentialist and ahistorical ways in which it has sometimes been deployed. So a definition of patriarchy needs to take into account, for example, categories of race, migration status, class, and so on. And these are structures of oppression that are crucial to understanding how power functions in US West Coast tech. So because of this, we also focus on a conception of patriarchy that is articulated with histories of personhood in America. What is at stake in this is the concept of who counts, who gets to be a proper person. In other words, who gets to own property rather than be property. So here we found Imani Perry's discussion of patriarchy in her book, Vexy Thing, really useful. So she turns to 17th century theorizations of personhood as delineated by the logics of the American frontier household. And as Perry points out, John Locke, the 17th century philosopher, gives us a very clear statement of how the ideal household, the imaginary household, is constructed. In his second treaties of government, he has us consider a master of the family with all these subordinate relations of wife, children, servants, and slaves united under a domestic rule of the family. So the master is the patriarch of the household and the other components are differently striated beneath him. So our argument that runs through the book is that this racialized, gendered, class shaping of personhood persists in the patriarchal network that we've identified, including the celebrification of the patriarchs, the makeup of the corporate households, workforces, and the exported products such as Instagram and well, Google search. So what is also useful about this conception of patriarchy is that rather than examining categories of male and female as key to what Perry calls patriarchal architectures, uh, she examines the history of personhood of what it means to be a full person. And this is understood not in binary gendered or sex terms, but in intersectional and hierarchical terms, which also take into account race and class, what it means to be a full or proper person through legislation and other factors. So a focus on the metaphor of the household rather than the binaries of male and female is therefore productive in as much as it doesn't reify and repeat sex difference, but at the same time is aware that particular patriarchal structures work to replicate sex and gender binaries. So we suggest that gendered hierarchies are reinforced and legitimated by the patriarchal network. And we can see this in the founder network, the workforces, and also how gender is manifest in the concordance as Ben was talking about. So the household, imagine, they also plays a key part in these men's celebrity profiles, but I'm going to skip that uh, right now and instead talk about patriarchy's relationship with misogyny. So in the book, we do touch on this, uh, the patriarchy's relationship with misogyny, but we don't really go into it in much depth. So I'll just uh, talk about a couple of examples and then I'll turn to our New Formations article where we, we discuss it a bit more. 
So, for example, we talk about Musk's employment of geek masculinity um, and his Rolling Stone interview with former pickup artist celebrity Neil Strauss, who uses what Sarah Brandt-Weiser, thanks Sarah, great talk, calls the discourses of inju injury typical to online misogyny as part of Musk's uh, celebrification. And we also have a chapter on Peter Thiel, who, who Ben talked about earlier, who is one of the most overt misogynists in our book. So he co-wrote the diversity myth multiculturalism and political intolerance on campus in, in the, and this came out in the 1990s and this is an anti-feminist screed against the so-called feminist monoculture at Stanford. Um, in 2009 he wrote a blog in which he stated that since 1920 the vast increase in welfare beneficiaries and extension of the franchise to women, two constituencies that are notoriously tough for libertarians, have rendered the notion of capitalist democracy into an oxymoron. So for him, the important thing is to protect uh, capitalism from feminism, that women's demands for equality threaten the very foundations of American patriarchal capitalism. And I'm going to return to this quote in a moment. So apart from Thiel and to a lesser extent Musk, in general, the founders that we look at harness liberal chirps for their celebrity rather than overt uh, anti-feminism. However, as Ben was saying, Thiel is a key node in the network. He's on the Facebook board. He's a key funder and influencer in Silicon Valley startup culture. Um, so, so it's important to focus in on his, on his anti-feminism here. So in our article for New Formations, um, thanks for publishing it, we, just, we tried to explore links between Google and the vitriolic hatred for women made increasingly visible online. Um, one of the ways that we do this is by thinking conjuncturally and noting how these visibilities and the monopolies coincide with the shift into a new form of capitalism, digital capitalism. So Sylvia Federici helps us unpack the potential links between patriarchal power and online misogyny. So she argues that the violence against women that was enacted in the shift from feudalism to modernity was a struggle over property and over personhood, where women who were economically autonomous were publicly murdered. The bodies of women were the territory on which these political battles were, uh, over capitalism were fought because women were consigned to unpaid labour to satisfy the needs of ascendant capitalism. So in her discussion of online misogyny, Eugenia Sapira, in the book on uh, misogyny and an online hatred that she co-edited with Debbie King, extends Federici's argument to explain the intensity of online misogyny as a gendered struggle over the ownership of digital technology. So Pira argues that there is an increased social competition imposed by neoliberal informational capitalism. And as a consequence of this, uh, she states, misogyny resurfaces as part of a, a struggle over a new division of labor. So this is why, for example, Thiel believes that cyberspace should be a site free of women, those persons who render capitalist democracy an oxymoron in order to properly forge and then actualize a future run by a male dominated patriarchal network. So we take these struggles over the division of labor to our analysis of a case study from 2017, where a Google employee called James Damore wrote a memo stating that women were biologically less suited to engineering jobs. So he was attacking Google's diverse, diversity initiatives in, in this uh, memo. After Damore was sacked, he was, so he was sacked by Google for this, he was then taken up by prom prominent celebrities of the alt-right who perceived him as being fired for truth, uh, and they saw him as a kind of influencer hero. So the memo got a lot of traction, and Damore was sacked by Google, as I just said, who wanted to distance themselves from its misogyny. However, in the article, we argue that the anti-feminism of the memo is more ideologically connected to Google than the corporation would like. So I'll touch on two reasons briefly here. One is workforces and the other is the ideology of datism. So for a start, Google underemploys women, including in leadership positions, as we can see um, on this slide. And there are some recent statistics from Google. The stats have improved over recent years, as I, as I show, show you there. Um, we suggest that whereas Google in its workplace pretends to organize women in such a way that might offer them a beneficial position within the, within the patriarchal hierarchy, Damore and then his alt-right ally to take him up, argue that women should be organized so that they are denied authority. 
women can be kept out of the offices of Silicon Valley's corporations by overt or covert sexual and racial harassment. And we've seen some high profile cases recently by hostile work cultures or by discriminatory recruit recruitment practices. But in the rhetorical and visual culture of online spaces, those which embrace James Moore, for example, these exclusionary strategies become more visually extreme. So secondly, um, De Moore relies heavily on the ideology of, ideology of datorism in his memo, datorism being one of the founding belief systems at Google, that is that decontextualized data provides objectivity. It is this ideology, ideology of datorism at Google that has forged what Sophia Mojo Noble calls its racist algorithms. We can see that the use of data in his memo is perfectly in line with Google's practices. We could understand De Moore's memo in the following way that he is taken up by the alt-right as a rigorous form of gatekeeping. De Moore is supposedly fired for truth, for speaking truth to power. But the problem for De Moore and the sections of the alt-right that support him is not the power of Google itself, but that Google might be idiotic enough to introduce initiatives that threaten its patriarchal structure. So remember that the memo is critiquing diversity initiatives at Google. The support for De Moore's memo is in the service of gatekeeping in the tech industry's workplaces, as well as policing which groups will be on the ascendant according to the shifting forces of power that are occurring within the digital conjuncture. In other words, if Google and the alt-right have points of alliance, particularly in terms of sexist and racist epistemic architectures, then the struggle that is taking place is triggered by the memo seems to be a struggle over its racial logics as well as how to organize women. So online misogyny, we could see, is not a niche practice. It's a key site of the contemporary political terrain. Um, Kate Mann's definition of misogyny and its relation to sexism and patriarchy is useful here. Mann argues that misogyny upholds the social norms of patriarchies by policing and patrolling them, whereas sexism serves to justify these norms, largely via an ideology of supposedly natural differences between men and women, with respect to their talents, interests, pro proclivities, and appetites. So in relation to uh, this quote, we could understand the patriarchal structures of Google to be sexist, and De Moore's memo is protecting this sexism when he perceives it as under threat. We can understand De Moore's employment of datorism as sexist also. However, the anxiety that pervades the memo obviously appeals to and is marshaled by the popular misogyny of the alt-right. As Mann argues, Misogyny taken alone uh, involves anxieties, fears, and desires to maintain a patriarchal order and a commitment to restoring it when it is disrupted. Mann says, sexism is bookish, misogyny is combative. And we can see how these dy dynamics play out on the very platforms owned by Google. For example, Susan Rashiki is the CEO of YouTube. However, in her interview with Kara Swisher, which was posted to YouTube, She's subject to misogyny and anti-Semitism, and we can see this in this quote here that's on the slide. Um, so I'll just conclude now. So it's important not to overstate the importance of James Damore as a historical actor. What is significant is how he's, he has been used by the alt-right and rejected by Google, indicating a fault line that only partially exists between conservatives and the tech industry. So we hope that our analysis reveals that Google engages in this conflict not to challenge patriarchal power, but instead to jostle for position within it and over its shape, contours, hierarchies and stratifications. In such a way, an important part of the digital conjuncture can be seen as the struggle over the future of patriarchy and particularly its racial and gendered logics. Thank you. Well, that was great. Uh, hang on. So Becca's Becca got out, but now she's coming back. Are you all right, Becca? No, I think she's having some technical. Yeah, I'm back. Else. Sorry about yeah. that. Okay. I'm good. Sorry. Thanks, Jim. Um, Alison, had you just finished? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Good timing. Um, uh, great. So sorry about that. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look and see what questions we've got because I missed that as well. Yeah, okay. 
I, I can't see any question that has already been asked, I'm afraid. So if you already asked a question, um, it'd be really kind of you to write it again. Sorry about that. I can, I can see one from Claire virtual. There's one from Claire, isn't there? And yeah, I thought that I could be, anyone. that could be a good place to start actually. Um, because, you know, Sarah, you, you brought up the news, the, the story that was in the news today around the Facebook whistleblower um Frances Haugen right and um I was thinking about her before Claire put her question there about a kind of as a kind of believable subject um making this critical challenge and thinking about how there was a kind of uh, believability was basically tied up with the kind of limits the reformist limits of what she was demanding what she was asking for um as I understand it um even though it's been described as a searing critique that she's offering of Facebook, she's really just asking to make Facebook more safe, right? Um, so it's not a kind of structural demand. So I was thinking about her as a kind of um, ideal, believable subject in a sense, but then Claire's question was really about, um, you know, is the ideal subject, the, the, you know, somebody who's, who's actually dead? And so I think it'd be really nice to, a question for both of you actually to think about Did Rebecca freeze? Jem, should I just address that? Sorry. Yeah, I think you should. Yeah. Okay. Sure uh, yeah. I, um, it's an interesting kind of uh, quest, kind of comparison between Francis Haugen and and Claire's question. Thank you for that question, Claire. Um, even though it's it, it, it's sort of an incredibly depressing uh, question. Um, uh, just to answer that, it is true that that there's something about the kind of the media sensationalist reporting on women who die um, because of sexual violence. Um, you know, is is kind of positions them as ideal. Uh, believable subjects such as Sarah Everard, of course, um, as well as many, many others. Um, it also is true that the kind of media spotlight on particular women who um, who die because of this, um, it, it's an uneven coverage, right? Because I would say part of that is because of this sort of conditional believability um, that I that I talked about. Um, I will also say that, um, you know, like if you think about some of these media productions that I'm talking about, you know, women, you know, when they die, they are believed in the in the media. So there's a sort of um, way in which the the media narratives, the you know, kind of fictional media narratives are uh, kind of taken from and distilled from real life um, examples. And so, it's it's striking to me to think that someone who's literally has no life and no no longer a kind of agentive quality to speak um, is the is a woman who is ultimately believable and so that should kind of tell us about this um, it, it, it also does speak to Francis Haugen I think um, in terms of the sort of performativity that women who make public accusations about harm um, often have to undergo in order to seem credible right um there are there have been whistleblowers about facebook uh, for, you know that from facebook before there have been women of color who have come forward about facebook and the harm that they do and it it you know i think that it's something that we should pay attention to that that it's this particular woman who is also very very um skilled in her job um, um, you know, in, in kind of her, she's established herself as a certain kind of expert that then she is believed. And you can see this happening um, in, in trials like, you know, Christine Blasey Ford um, against Brett Ka Kavanaugh, how she, you know, kind of had to perform a certain kind of credibility that also had to do with whiteness. And so, so um, I, I do think that there, there is a performance of believable of believability that is requires labor and and um, and I also think that um, it's still regardless of that labor it's still quite often that you're not believed we'll see what happens 
if Facebook does anything. I mean, Zuckerberg has already come out and said this is categorically false, right? So he's already come out and said this is um, sh this is not true about the company. And so it, so then it gets in this kind of um, dynamic, this you know, a gender dy dynamic um, that still is is you know. Illustrate it illustrates the kind of labor that women have to undergo to be believed. Does that answer that, Claire? Um, yeah, I think that's great, Sarah. Um, Alison and Ben, do you want to speak about the about Francis Haugen, the whistleblower, as well? I was just I was just thinking as Sarah was talking. I I sort of had. I mean, it must have been the first time I've watched BBC News in about two years, but I just had it on like in the background while I was somewhere last night, and um, they had this guy come on, I remember it was, it was this morning, this guy came on whose daughter had died uh, after, and the, the narrative is after seeing images on, on Inst Instagram, and he was then campaigning, and the BBC segment was him talking to, to Francis Haugen. And, and I just thought like, I mean, I don't wanna, I don't wanna over, you know, read too much into that, but like the legitimate person speaking is not, is not the dead girl, but the dead girl's white middle class father and that I mean I don't know I'm, I'm I don't have I don't have a properly formulated thought but there's something there's something about you know she translates him into the legitimate critic of Facebook um and and that that was the thing which which the BBC chose to put there so I, I'm not going to try and say any more than that but it does that like in the concept of what Sarah just said that did seem significant Alison, did you want to come in now? I'm sorry, my baby's screaming. <laughs> Concentrating, but um, maybe later I'll, I'll come in. Yeah. Um, let's go to the next question, which is from Tatiana. And she's asking really two quite big questions, which everyone can see in the chat. And the first one is about what can we do to tackle misinformation um, in this in the, in the digital media scape. Um, and, you know, I think on one level, this is about flows of information and disinformation. And uh, Sarah talked about post-truth conjuncture in her opening words. So I think, um, yeah, I would invite Sarah, I think, to, to respond to that question. I, uh, thanks, Tatiana, and it's nice to, to see you, Tatiana, was a student of mine. Um, um, I, I love that, Rebecca, thank you so much for giving me the question, how can we as a society tackle the spread of misinformation? Um, <laughs> um, I, I, it's a complex question, um, and I'm not going to be able to offer some kind of, you know, roadmap to thinking about thinking through this. I mean, I think that um, one of the things that we need to, you know, continue to recognize, and Allison and Ben are talking about this, is the way in which um, um, the, the, the sort of assumptions and mythologies and imaginaries that we place within digital platforms, as if somehow they are that that things like racism and misogyny are not are not like Sophia Noble has said baked into the algorithm, right? So so, so recognizing the the you know um, or, or resisting this idea that somehow this is just information. I mean, I think that one of the things and other people have said this much more eloquently than me that that we need to do is to stop talking about it as misinformation, as if the information that came before this like proliferation of myths and this was somehow neutral and objective and universal. And so um, I think that one of the things that we need to think about is, 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 is this notion of truth? And, and I do think that um, like analytically or epistemologically, what I'm, what, what, what Kat Higgins and I are suggesting in this work, work is to what would happen if we, if we shifted our, our focus in tackling, like you said, Tatiana, uh, misinformation, what, what would happen if we shifted our focus from an epistemological position of the truth to a subjective position of believability? And then, and then talked about this as a positionality rather than, you know, um, as situated. I mean, this is stuff that that feminists have been talking about, and 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 critical race theorists have been talking about for a long time to think about situated knowledges rather than um, universal knowledge. And so, I think that that is one thing we can do is actually resist this idea that somehow this is a crisis 
um, that is a new crisis and post-truth. Arguably, women and people of color have always lived in a crisis of post-truth because they haven't been believed. And so, so that one thing is, is to just, um, Tatiana, is to just challenge the vocabulary, right? Challenge the discourses that we are using, the assumptions that we are using um, um, to create certain kinds of truth. Um, uh, so that that would be uh, one 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 way. I mean, there are other people have said other things like media refusal. I, I think that that's um, you know it, it can be a an individual um, it, way to address this. And individually, sometimes we need to refuse media. We need to not participate in these um, networks. Um, but I also think that that is you know in in a in a kind of um, technological landscape that privileges visibility when you make your when you when you become invisible because um, you have been the target of all these things you know that that also has a price um, you know that that women and and communities of color play, pay so I don't know Ben do you have I, I'm gonna look at you to say to see if there's another response hope that ben, helped too. Ben does it connect in with the critique that you're making of dataism? Um, and somehow thinking about information in a different way. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the thing the thing with the thing with dataism is dataism sits behind behind the algorithms. Like dataism is the ideology of the people who produce the algorithms which deliver us the news, which is mis or disinforming or, or or disempowering. And and actually, what 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 it does is it encodes as neutral and natural a very particular perspective as the truth. And so when we talk about misinformation, are we not we're, we're like talking about like those algorithms not doing the work that they're supposed to be doing, right? Which is supposed to be delivering a very particular view of liberal view of the world to us in a way that that is accepted and sort of recognised and shared as being like you know the truthful uh view of the world but at the same time uh when it comes to things like information about uh pandemic interventions it's very handy sometimes to have people who uh, are quite invested in the views of particular sorts of scientists um to be to be taken as seen as credible so um yeah there's there's some there's some complexity there in in the current moment i mean like i don't think anyone who worked in the health industry you know health sector would say that it was like a particularly good example of a of a of a feminist space um i think mostly mostly they'd say the exact opposite and there's certainly about forms of power that are encoded within it um which would apply which would which would be yeah which would be helpful to extrapolate across sort of dataist approaches or scientist scientistic I mean, dataism is like a form of scientism, right? It's a form of like belief and ab an absolute truth expressed through science. Um, yeah, so it's complicated because actually, like, you you kind of you know you, you want you want people to to trust vaccines, or at least I do. Um, and yet, at the same time, like, is in those yeah in that in that nexus of uh, technology and liberalism and dataism and algorithms and mis disinformation um yeah yeah it's i don't have an easy answer no <laughs> but, um, but i think i think yes it, like like i think i think the problem is is the idea that a certain set of liberal values are taken as um universal or taken which is you know how they're presented taken as holding a truth that uh, should be communicated through algorithms, but isn't. So that means I think the answer is not um, that we um, is not that we. Yeah, I don't know. I'm stuck. No, I've got myself into a hole. Well, let's move it on a bit um, because I think one thing I was interested in is how you talk about dataism as Google's corporate ideology, if you like, but also entangled in this is uh, evolutionary psychology uh, or a kind of weird appropriation of evolutionary psychology so i wonder if you're alison i'm not sure if alison's there or not but perhaps you would like to talk about how um evolutionary psychology becomes part of this mix le uh, legitimating um forms of patriarchy that you're describing 
Is she there? She's much better on this than I am. Um, so we can wait for her. We can hold on. We can, can hold on it. <laughs> have a go. Have a go, Ben. Um, I think. I think the thing with evolutionary psychology is that there's a particular there's a particular version of it which is popular and um, has been widely and successfully disseminated, particularly online. Um, and Damore was someone who expressed that and, it, and also incorporated into the sort of core views of the all right. And evolutionary psychology basically posits that, you know, gender and sex are hardwired, that women behave in particular ways to attract mates and men behave in particular ways to do the same. And that this is a useful and helpful way to understand um, society because it understands why we're motivated to do the things that we do. And like, you know, is, is foundational to who we are as human beings and explains why we're successful on the planet and all, and all of that sort of stuff. And it's, it's, it's sort of a common sense evolutionary psychology. I mean, when you talk to actual evolutionary psychologists, they tend to have a more complicated view of the world, um, tend to talk about collaboration a lot more than um, competition. Um, but the version of evolutionary psychology that we get and that is disseminated wide, widely um, is one that, yeah, basically embeds conservative gender norms as, as not only normative but desirable and biological effectively um and then this when this gets taken up and used by the alt-right as a sort of a rally a rally inquiry it's used to oppose everything from you know feminism to you know it, it fuels transphobia it's it's you know it's, it's a very potent um form of truth and that's not the form of truth um yeah, that, that, or that is the form of truth that sits behind, or could be, I don't know, the datarism thing's complicated. <laughs> um, because it's, it doesn't have to be contextualized. It's, I mean, datarism, datarism is practiced by Silicon Valley. It's just, like, it's just like the algorithm will produce a form of social reality that can then be used to sell people more stuff and it works, so therefore it's true. Um, yeah, but if, if Alison pops back, maybe she'll be able to say- She more. can add something, yeah, if she, if she comes back. Um, Sarah, you might want to speak to that point about evolutionary psychology, or um, to Tatiana's uh, sec second part of Tatiana's question about uh, transnational um, differences, I think. Um, but there's also a question from Karen here about um, more about believability, right? Everyone can read the question here. Um, so I think Sarah, pick pick what way you'd like to to, to carry on from there. There's a, a lot of directions we could take this in um, from this point. Sure. And let me just, I'm reading yeah. Karen's question. Um, um, I, I mean, I think that, that, I think that Tatiana's question about scattered hegemonies is also a really, really um, important one. Um, and, and, um, and actually, you know, Ben, Ben and Allison's um, use of um, Imani Perry's Vexi thing is so brilliant and she is so brilliant about thinking about what it looks like when patriarchies um, are you know kind of traverse borders uh, geographic borders and and how how other conjunctures like empire and colonialism and um, enslavement have to do always with the understanding of patriarchy and what it means to uphold that so so when we you know um, the the transnational issues of of scattered hegemonies where different kinds of hegemonies take shape and take hold in different geopolitical contexts because of of you know geopolitical differences whether or not that's about land or um about infrastructure or about um, a kind of liberal notion of rights, you know, that that we have to think about these things when we're talking about the conjuncture, right? Um, and, and that also is one of the, I think, the, the incredibly useful and, and, and always useful, at least for me in my work throughout my career, um, tool of the, con of, of the conjuncture to think about how these different um, tensions and contradictions um, fuse, you know, Hall talks about from Gramsci, fuse together um, to, to build a sort of a particular kind of content contentious unity. And so um, I think that, that there's no, it doesn't make sense at all to talk about a conjuncture um, within gender and believability and patriarchy um, if you're only talking about it from a um, kind of Western uh, position. So I would, I would say that that trans, you know, scattered hegemonies and transnational feminism has to be a part of 
of any kind of thinking about conjunctures. Um, do you want me to to talk to, to, to address Karen's question? Yeah, go ahead. And and Claire's just made a really important, um, well, really interesting um, kind of addition to that as well. So we've got some kind of continuing discussion and interest in the question of believability, I think. So yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Okay, and then Jilly Kay also had a question. I just don't want to pass her up. Um, um, Okay, Karen, so the issue you have with the Believe Women narrative is that it isn't applied to both sides of the political aisle. So Tara Reid comes forward with allegations of rape against Biden. She's not heard. Monica Lewinsky was tortured for years. Mm -hmm. So was um, Paula Jones, by the way, in terms of, I don't know if you've seen um, impeachment, but um, there's this, and you know, back to, to the earlier point about credibility, there's this incredible makeover that Paula Jones, who also accused Clinton of sexual harassment, was, um, she went through with her lawyer in order for her to not seem to be kind of a working class, ignorant, um, young woman from the country, right? Um, and, and so this kind of the way in which believability was literally like an outfit and makeover that she had to go through in order to, to be believed. So I, I don't think I, I disagree at all, Karen, with, you know, don't these two examples of believe women make it really about ideology uh, I, I, I would say it is about ideology. I'd also say, though, it is about kind of material practice. I'd, I'd say it is about, uh, you know, again, a conjuncture of discourses that, and this is what I'm sort of trying to get at in, in terms of thinking about conditional believability, right? Why I'm, I'm thinking, why we're thinking about an economy of, of believability is that you can, you know, there are different positionalities within this economy that are in relationship to resources and labor, right? And, and, and some, and, and like I, I was saying before, you know, the more resources a subject already has in terms of cultural and economic and political capital, the less labor is required for them to um, secure access to believability. So, um, you know, and for women in general, it's there's there's a lot of labor that is required to secure that access. But if you are a white woman um, and you're accusing and this this we see in, you know, all sorts of ways, you know, in the United States from Emmett till, you know, to, to today to thinking about, you know, this idea of calling the cops on on um, people who are living while being black, um, you know, and the and the and the kind of conviction that people that that white women who call the cops have that they will be believed. The you know the the certainty there is about this kind of conditional believability. So I do think um, that it's about ideology. Um, I don't, th I think that believability though is also about other kinds of practices. It is embedded in the law and legal discourses. It's embedded in structure. It's embedded in, in, in criminality. Um, and it's embedded in definitions of gender itself. And so it is about ideology, um, but it's also, I, I, I want to think about it. I think it's more helpful for me to think about it conjuncturally. I hope that addresses that, Karen. And that makes sense. And the concept of talking, the focus on talking about economies of believability seems to help to cut across those different um, levels or different, um, um, yeah, those different problematics, right? Um, so uh, I think that I can't see Jilly's question, Sarah. So I, I saw, did I not? Jilly Kay, thank, was wondering if Sarah could say something more about the political potential of futility. Uh, let's go, yeah, let's talk about that. I can't see that question, but um, I think that would be a good one to talk about. And then uh, if you speak about that first, and then we can go to Ben and see if Alison's back as well. Sure. Um, and Jilly says, uh, thank you, Jilly, for that question, and she says that it's, a, it's an, an, a generative alternative to the obsession with stoicism that prevails in the manosphere. But what might be the difference between apathy and futility? Um, that's a great question. And Ben, I think you probably have some interesting things to say about apathy versus futility. I, you know, again, what I, I, I was, you know, thinking about this and, and again, I, I want to mention, 
Joe Littler, who who we in a discussion about these shows that I'm looking at, was like, really, that seems like the thing that holds them together. Things like I May Destroy You and, and The Morning Show and and Promising Young Woman and The Assistant is futility. Like it's it's like th this is going to fail. And so um, thinking about that rather than, again, this sort of conventional redemptive narrative that is about stoicism, like you said, Jilly, or resilience, a neoliberal form of resilience, or just being, you know, saying, I'm confident, you know, I'm going to be confident today, um, you know, as a way to kind of move forward and through an impasse and through victimhood and survivorhood and everything else. I think that futility, um, if we think about it in terms of a sort of productive failure, and here thinking about some something like Jack Halberstam's work on the queer art of failure, where to fail isn't in the kind of Ben knows this, the, the big Silicon Valley, like too big to fail or fail harder, or feel better, or fail all the time, as long as you make a gazillion dollars, whatever it is. Um, you know, instead of that sort of understanding of failure, but failure being a refusal to adhere to patriarchal norms, a refusal to, um, to kind of embrace a heteronormativity as one's existence. Um, and so that is where I see futility um, kind of paired with is, is this productive failure, which is quite different, I think, than apathy. Um, uh, I, anyway, that's what I would say. Thanks, Sarah. Um, ben, maybe you'd like to say something about that, or we have a very interesting question from Sean. So what would you prefer? Because I'm going to need to summarise Sean's question, if you prefer that one. Um, I, yeah, on, on futility, yeah, I, I, can, I can have a go. I mean, I think, I think, I mean, I think apathy is like the default state of, I mean, not just of digital capitalism I mean Jeremy's written about this like you know about about neoliberalism in general like people don't don't want it like but you can't really live without it you can't be outside it I mean you can stop like you know I, I deleted my Facebook account like halfway through writing this book you know when I realized I didn't need it anymore to write the book and and actually you know I haven't missed it at all but like Facebook doesn't give a shit right you know it's not gonna it's not gonna affect them and and even if, even if say you know 100 million of us did it it's still really not gonna affect them very much so it's not it's not like a it's, it's, it's not like you can you can sort of opt out of this world i mean you can't you can't function without the internet very effectively anymore it's like it's it's a really it's you know you have to operate within the space of these huge tech companies and and yeah resistance is, is futile on, on one level so i think i think there's uh you know and on, and on the other it's, it's you build all of these um you can build alternatives but the the scale and size they'd need to be you know platform cooperatives all that sort of stuff that the scale and size they'd need to be to actually displace a google or a facebook is like so i mean it's impossible right there's a reason why they've they, they've cemented and secured that space so i think i think once once we give up on that once we give up on sort of um trying to reform or change or or or, or challenge um like you know face, facebook or google and can actually start to look at like you know what's the underlying politics there like that's the space we need to be in to sort of think about like a, a, a fundamental shift away from a, a system which enables these companies to have such unprecedented power in our lives and to organize to organize our access to information to organize our mode of interaction with other people like once we sort of stop that and start to say well actually fundamentally we need to be thinking about it's you know from from the book it feels very very strongly that the era we're living in is is restorative it's just trying to restore like 18th 19th century liberalism which is based around a particular patriarchal household where certain people have authority and other people are organized underneath them once we sort of go for that like maybe there's a different space and that is what's happening that is what's happening with social movements that is what's happening um not in, not entirely but i think i think I think it's it's an important part of um, of the support that trans politics gets is about that it's 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 a viable location for resistance to the dominance of a particular form of patriarchy. It's a way of refu it's it's refusal, and it's not it's not necessarily that the people everyone supporting it like like you know it's it's not about trans people per se. It's that the, it's the possibility of trans. Is a possibility of undermining and under and sort of destroying basically the foundations of and, and that's what people are so scared about and that's why it gets so much opposition and that's why it's so 
it's so contentious. I, I, I genuinely don't think it's, it, I mean, trans people experience the brunt of it, but yeah. So once we sort of accept that we're not, you know, we live, we live in this world. Oh, I'm done. Right. We're out of time. Thanks, Ben. No, I'm, you got muted by, um, because I was readmitting, I was readmitting with Rebecca and I clicked on you. By, I'm having you a, just I'm having a terrible last... chairing experience today, so... <laughs> Sorry, just say that, Ben, just say the last sentence. Yeah, then. say the last bit My again. My words got clear. Um, I, I just, I was just, yeah, I, I think I think that, you know, trans people become a locus for all the different pressures that are going on, but actually that that is the space, the space where you can resist, like the liberal household of the, of the 18th century of John Locke, um, like that's that's where the possibility of resisting everything from, you know, Mark Zuckerberg through to Donald Trump sits. I think that's the thing we've got to go for, is that. So were we still on futility or have we gone on to Sean's question? No, no, that's still that's still futility. It's still pretty futile. Still futility. <laughs> I mean, it might be, it might be the only way you can go. But, it's... <laughs> but it does segue very nicely into Sean's question, which I cannot now see, but I remember is to do with the kind of uh, attacks on academia, um, the idea that we're all teaching, you know, um, wokeness to our students. Um, and it also fits in with um, what Sarah was saying about uh, Butler's intervention around anti-gender anti ideology, right? Um, mm. So um, if someone who can see the question can summarize it, perhaps Jem yeah, would be good, I, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I can, yeah. Um, well, so Sean uh, is asking, he's talking about the the kind of similarity, basically, between sort of anti-woke, the sort of anti-woke rhetoric and, you know, and the way it sort of shades into, you know, um, sort of gender critical theory, even in places. And, um, for example, you know, sort of prestigious traditional social science journals who also, like all of these, all of these different sources are sort of, using a fairly similar language to dismiss critical scholarship in often quite gendered terms you know, both both in terms of what it says about gender and you know in the gendered nature of the assumptions about the difference between objective truth and non-objective truth i think i mean sean's that is that a fair summary sean you could it would have been quicker for sean just to do that you know cheers Jeff. that sounds fine yeah just just uh I'm thinking here of that terrible book, some of you might have seen, Cynical Theories, which it's so striking how gendered the rhetoric is and how it's so similar to the mission statement. You know, I'm in the field of communication studies. Often the most high-ranking journals are quite positive journals, and the rhetoric they're using is very similar. So it goes a little bit to Ben's point about some of the tensions within liberalism. You know, it seems to me a lot of the reactionary rhetoric now is also... Uh, similar to what you get within dominant paradigms within the social sciences. Uh, I, ben, do you want me to address that? I want to make sure that Allison, if Allison is not tending to the baby. Um, thanks, Sean. Um, you're reminding me once um, about a, a review of a journal article that I submitted um, to a journal in our field um, where, where the reviewer um, asked me to stop using feminism as an anecdote um, and instead wanted me to replace my analysis, my feminist analysis with a content analysis, which I don't do. So, um, but it, it reminds me of like, what kind of evidence, I mean, I think that in your question, you said, you know, like that, that this, this uh, evidence based, you know, that these, the kind of the, the, the far right critiques of um, those of us who are doing this kind of work is often framed through an appeal to evidence-based uh, scholarship, often indistinguishable from the kind of rhetoric we find in these high-ranking social science journals. So I would say yes to that. Um, and I would say, um, and, and this kind of gets back to, I think, um, this idea of challenging the actual kind of root of the, of the concept of information um, that, that in, and, and that another thing that we need to do is is challenge the root of evidence. And, and in, in cases of sexual violence, feminists have been doing this for decades and decades. Like, you know, that, that evidence 
means something different um, um, in, in like, let's say a Western court of law, um, if you are a woman accusing a man. So, so I, I think that, that um, it's a really, really good question. And it does speak this kind of new attack does speak to the gender, sort of the gender-based, how knowledge is always gender-based. Um, I would also just reiterate that, and again, I don't think that there is no crisis of the post-truth right now, but I think it is a particular crisis of the post-truth. And it is interesting that words like misinformation and post-truth and disinformation become part of you know, common parlance when particular subjects have had their truths questioned, whether or not those subjects are, are from the left or from the right, but that, that it is a particular kind of uh, privileged position, um, epistemological position where you are automatically seen to be a truth teller. Right. And so if you're not automatically seen to be a truth teller, um, then you can also argue that this has been the, the, the context for lots of people outside of that frame for, for centuries, as Perry talks about. I hope that addresses it a little bit. I want to give Ben time. Sorry, my daughters are getting excited because they know Sarah and they. <laughs> Happy birthday, Isla. Bye. Okay, now, 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 go and let Ben answer the question. Okay, Thanks. say bye bye. Bye. Thank you. For now. <laughs> sure, it's much more fun. Um, talk happy birthdays. Um, I was, I was just going to say that there's a tension in our book, right? There's a tension in our book, and that we try to quantify the sexism we found, and we did that particularly to try and, you know, specifically to try and, um. I guess short, short circuit, those sorts of critiques to sort of say, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I could go into it, but I've, I've, we've, had, we've had feedback on our project, which is like, this is all woolly bullshit. Like, and so I was like, okay, you're gonna have some numbers then, right? And so there's numbers and we can quantify it. But I don't think, you know, I think actually, I don't know what you thought in terms of the paper, but for me, and I think for Alison, some of this stuff sits uneasily together, like, you know, trying to sort of specify, you know, how many words are being used to, to describe women or, or, or whatever, or, or some of the, that sort of methodological stuff. It doesn't sit naturally and easily with the more sort of philosophical, particularly the sort of feminist theory, and we, we are fully aware of sort of feminist critiques of that sort of work. Um, but I think it's important to try and make some inroads into those spaces to try and have work that's defensible in them. Um, and that's because actually like those spaces are so bad uh, and the work that's produced is, is it's really uncritical. It really doesn't look at its own sort of assumptions and foundations and you need to be able to talk a little bit of the language to be able to get in there. So that's something which was, you know, quite deliberate in our project and something we were, you know, attentive to. Okay, that's fantastic. <clears throat> Thanks, Ben. And so uh, Becca's had to give up with the tech, so I'm going to close us out. I just want to say thanks very much to everybody for coming. Thanks to Ben and Alison and Sarah. Those are really just fantastic talks, a fantastic discussion. I really um, learned a lot. Uh, thank you very much to everyone for coming. Uh, next week, uh, at the same time, we're going to have a seminar about the current political conjuncture in Mexico. And um, with uh, Gab Gabriela Mendez Cotta and uh, Benjamin Ar Arditi will be speaking. And um, uh, it's always hard for us to get people to attend things that are not about British or American politics and culture. So make sure you do, or you won't sleep that night. And um, <clears throat> well, I'm just gonna say thanks again to everybody for coming. Thanks to the speakers. It was really, uh, really extraordinary seminar. I learned, uh, I really learned a lot. Um, thanks everyone and bye-bye. Um,